Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 631. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Doctor and Origin. I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the Sensei of the Whatnot, the Duke of You Know, the indestructible, bridge-defying Sultan of Strategery, will not be joining us this episode due to injuries sustained as a stunt double for the Peacemaker <laughs> opening dance sequence. But he's usually the elder statesman of the podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? <laughs> Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about I Am Batman number six and Task Force Z number four. Plus, we have a speeding bullet segment talking about some of our recent favorites as well we are sponsored as always by dcb service and instocktrades.com jim can you tell us what's going on at dcbservice.com justice league issue number 75 death of the justice league 40 percent off 419 and that also is 40 percent off all of the uh well the three variant covers that they have for this so plus we've got justice league hardcover volume one 50 percent off 1249 and Justice League, the new 52 Omnibus uh, hardcover volume 2, 50% off, only $75. So thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, you have some of the new releases. They have Batman, the Joker Ward Trade Paperback Volume 2. This is $16.99 regularly. It's 42% off, only $9.85. Batman Detective Comics, the hardcover volume 1, The Neighborhood. This is the 2021 series, $29.99 regularly, 42% off, only $17.39. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Seglin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Green Lantern, let you and I destroy that space junk. Jim, before we jump into the main show, let's talk a little speeding bullets. You actually were talking just now. You said you had something that you wanted to share that you've been digging. Dude, I got caught up on Icon and Rocket. Oh, yeah. And, oh, my God, am I loving this story. I, it, I, it's one of those things where after, you know, because we, we talk about the first issue and then everything that happens, I, you know, I start stockpiling. So I've got a couple of issues that I stockpiled. And I was like, you know, yeah, I'm going to read. I, I'm going to get caught up on Icon and Rocket. And I was just like, I started diving into it after that first issue. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is awesome. And then and immediately it gets you motivated to go read the old stuff. You know, the original stuff that came out. I'm reading that stuff. I'm starting to read that stuff now going, holy crap, this thing, this is fabulous. So I'm really, really loving, you know, this book. And I love the fact that it is an alternate Earth, you know, because I didn't know if this was, you know, the Earth Prime or, you know, the, you know, Earth One Zero, whatever number we're calling it, or if this is a different Earth. This is a completely different Earth. This is an Earth where there is no Superman. And they explain why there is no Superman, and it's a neat story why there is no Superman. And I'm like, holy crap, man. So it got me going really wanting to dive into that universe, into that Earth, see what's going on. And it's, again, it was funny because reading the one book from that series now has me wanting to get completely caught up on all the other books because those are other ones that stockpiled on me because I'm reading different other stuff for the show and whatnot. So now I'm next, I'm going to start diving into all the other ones from that universe, you know, and get a complete caught up on everything. Because again, this is just, this is a really cool story going on and that I'm loving, man. I'm absolutely loving this thing. Writing and art has been really key. They've, they've done a great job. They've got great creative teams on those books. They feel like top-tier books, and I think that's a key for a launch like this. I also love the season format. I think it's, it's a different sort of approach. You know, I mean, yes, they're mini limited series and things like that, but I like the idea of branding it the way that you do binge watch shows that we all are into watching right now. I think it's just a really nice approach. And I think for whether you collect it digitally or you collect it um, in a trade or hardcover format, it also presents itself in a really unique way for people at bookstores and and comic shops and things. Bookstores in particular, I'm thinking of where you know you can casually come across it. Uh, it's Comicsology is going to be emerging with Amazon. I mean, they already are, but I mean, it's further integrating into the Amazon ecosystem. 
And all I'm hoping that comes out of that is a greater awareness of comics like this that people can grab that may be something that matches their movie tastes or matches their... Because you know how Amazon makes recommendations? I'm yeah. hoping comics start to pop up as recommendations for people that don't traditionally look at them. And I'm hoping that Amazon further integrates it that way because I think there's a great opportunity for them to promote product that will obviously bring them profit but will also point people to comics, which... That's a win-win on my end. Have you read The Monkey Prince? Not yet. So I, I, I got it right there. So I read issue number one of this. And I read Zero a while, you know, a while ago when it came out. And it was um, the, that, the free uh, issue Zero that was out there. And again, another property I didn't know anything about. This is new. So the premise of issue number one is you've got this kid who has parents that uh, are kind of like, foster parents, uh, adoptive parents, that they kind of wind up being in jobs for supervillains where they're, because of their scientific skills or things like that, it's hard to find work in Gotham. So you end up, you end up getting hired for your skills and you're doing things that are legal, illegal-ish, you know, where it's like you can see, like, okay, they're getting into work, but there's some ethical issues in this work that they're getting involved in, and they're doing experiments for the penguin, they're doing experiments for this person, they're doing things for that. Well, obviously, because of their ties to these criminals, they have information. And who would want to seek out that information if you're in Gotham City other than Batman? Well, imagine you're a kid and you walk in on this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know that's the environment like this kid's growing up in. So he's terror. Batman to him is not a hero. Batman to him is a nightmare. You know, and, and you get it. You know, you, like he looks at black curtains on uh, a curtain rod and freaks him out because of this. He's he's in high school and he's being picked on. You know, because of the fact that he's dealing with some childhood traumas and things like that. Not all Batman based. You know, he's kind of like this awkward kid and things like that. Well, turns out there's more to his story and that he is, in fact, the Monkey Prince. And it's it's a really cool story. Uh, it unfolds along the way. I'm kind of giving you a very Cliff Notes baseline version of it because I like the kid. And the fact that the kid's very relatable and he feels real. He's not like this awkward kid for the sake of being awkward where like they overdo it. You see how... This is what would happen at a school. He would get bullied, you know, and these type yep. of things. And they don't go too over the top with it. It's more natural. You relate to him and you, you hope for something good to come of it because he's more of a victim of circumstance than anything. He, you know, he hasn't done anything wrong. He just winds up, you know, can't help who his adoptive parents were. But you find out there's more, much more to his story. And it unfolds pretty quickly as the story heads on. Uh, he He's at a school where... One of, uh, shall we say, the Bat family attends. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that character plays into this miniseries. So it's it's definitely a story that it isn't taking place con like in the current timeline, at least right now, with where it's at. It's like fairly recent. But, you know, with and I'm saying this in relation to what I know is happening with this particular character. And I'm going to leave it at that. To say that there's the right amount of guest appearances to make you feel instantly like this is a part of the greater DC universe. You can place where its time is, where it takes place, and it's a true origin of this character. I found that I really enjoyed issue zero. Issue one, I like much better because it's been given a chance to breathe. And that's not a knock on issue zero. Issue zero was meant to be like a teaser. And as a teaser, it really worked for me. We talked about it on the show and I really enjoyed it. But what I like about this is you see how this is a mini series is got a lot more breathing room and is going to be able to really help us get to know the character in and out of, um, it's hard to say the costume, <laughs> <laughs> considering he's the monkey prince. There, there's a rich world to be delved on here. It's something I, I, because I enjoyed issue zero, I jumped on this and found that I love that it's pro from a progression standpoint. I loved issue one more. You don't need to read issue zero to jump on issue one. So don't feel like if you didn't read that, like you can't go on board. Um, issue zero really acts as more of a teaser to this than a necessary read for this particular component. I'm not knocking issue zero with that. It's just, this is a fresh story right out of the gate. You need nothing to go into this and enjoy it. Uh, great art, 
great writing, and I'm, I'm really enjoying this uh, even more than I thought I was going to from issue zero. Have you read World of Krypton? Um, yeah. So, well, I think like I'm not caught up on it, but yeah. So I, I'm up to there's it's it's a six issue miniseries, and I'm on issue three of it, and I'm not going to go super spoilery on it, but I want to point people to this if you're missing it. Um, it's Robert Venditti and Michael Avenomeg, and apologies for any name butchery there because it's a great creative team on this. They're really delving into the lore of Krypton, and give this takes place before the events that we know that happened to the origin story of Superman. So a lot of this is the prehistory. There are characters, we get to see very early appearances of Supergirl in this, and, and a lot of her origin story, her family. It's, it's a real exploration of not just the House of El, but the House of Zod and the other houses that take place in there. There is a notable appearance of a very cool DC superhero in this story that should be in every story that I really, really enjoyed. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we uh, all know which superhero you're talking about by your excitement. That's <laughs> right. I was real. I, I was, and that I was not something I was expecting, but I was glad to see that, uh, especially with Robert Venditti being such yeah. a part of that, uh, that he brought this into the world of Krypton lore. But we get to see a lot of the origins of things that we know that are staples of the Superman universe in this story. And I the exploration of Jorel and Lara. Here's what I love about it. I'm reading this Dark Knights of Steel miniseries, and you could see how this, even though that's like an alternate universe, you could see how Jorel and Lara from this could wind up being the Jorel and Lara in Dark Knights of Steel. You know, if the if things in this particular story would have gone a little differently. Uh, I really love that aspect of this. I, I love Jorel, I love Lara, I love the politics. I love uh, the action, I love the drama, and really getting into the heads of uh, the House of El and Zod. And, uh, Zod is a winner in this big time. I'm really enjoying this series. If you're missing it and you're in any way, shape, or form a Superman fan or interested in the backstory of Krypton, this is a really, really good series that I don't hear a lot of people talking about right now. So I wanted to shout this one out and remind people that it's out there and it's, it's not one to be missed. I'm, I'm, are you digging it as much as I am? Well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm through the first issue only, so I'm behind. I and mean, again, it's one of those things where I read it, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I want more, you know, and, but again, yeah, time just, yeah, I run out of time on stuff. So this is something that is getting stockpiled. And I think it's, I think it's one of the problems that a book like this is going to have in that, you know, it, it's a cool, it was a really cool story. Right from the gate, I wanted to read more. So issue one got me wanting to read more, but because it's a limited series, because it's not current continuity, it always ends up getting put on the back burner sometimes. I think people probably, same thing happened with that. That's probably why we're not hearing too many people talk about it. And see, I would say if you're missing it because of that, you're making a mistake. Yeah. Because I think it's really important to, the history of Krypton, and I think it's a story that's going to be one of those that people are going to talk about and point out to people that you shouldn't have missed that. And I want to see more stories like this, so I'm urging people, if you are interested in this at all, jump on this. It's really, really good. Like, I binge read the first three issues, and I'm like, oh, what am I missing? This will not go down on the pile when it comes in <laughs> again. I'm, I'm going to be grabbing this one. Did you read Batman the Night, issue number one? No, not that yet. That 10-issue series. So this is like a, it's not a year one story, it's well before that. This is a, a formative years of Batman miniseries. And starts telling a story of a, of a young Bruce who is trying to figure out his place in the world. A very angry young Bruce who's trying to figure out his place in the world. This is before he begins the training. You know, I mean, and I'm talking about, this is when he's a hobbyist, you know, trying to delve into things and has not organized himself yet, has not made the decision to leave Gotham yet. He's this kid whose parents have died. He's trying to integrate back into school. And uh, as you can guess, he has, as we know, he has issues <laughs> and he's trying to deal with those issues. And it's it affects things like friendships. And he's also got the fact that he is a billionaire and that makes him a uh, a target for people who are trying to get control of that money and get control of that person. 
and there's some very interesting things that are happening there with that scenario. It's it's very very intriguing. It's clearly leading into it's it's a it's a ten issue miniseries. It's clearly leading into what gets Bruce on his journey. Where does Bruce go from here? How does he grow? Cool. How does he start training and things like that? It's really timely if you're interested in the Batman movie because of the fact that this would predate that movie as well. So it kind of feels like, oh, it's kind of fun to read this right now and get all <laughs> ramped up for the movie that's coming down the pike. Um, really excited about this. Last thing I want to chat about is the movie. You and I talked this week about making plans to go see the movie, and I'm, I'm excited that we're going to one of those fan event ones on the Wednesday. I've got a ticket to go see it at IMAX the night before. I cannot. I, I know this is going to be at least three times I'm going to see this doggone thing in the theater. Because I am so stoked to see this movie. Every time, like now, seeing the trailers just gets me more excited for going to see it. But I don't need to see anything more at this point. I just want to go. Like, I, like I'm ready. Like, let's get this movie out. I want to go see it. What I loved was this, though. And it's why I'm bringing this up right now. In both cases, I there's these DC fan events. And if, if, you, ha- if you have it available in your area... Get yourself out there and get a pre- ticket for the fan events because, I don't know, it's kind of a cool thing to go to the fan event version. But I have high hopes that this film's going to be the next Spider-Man as far as with fan interest because it was really hard to get seats for both of these. And I jumped on early. I think that's great news for this film. It's great news for film in general because it's always kind of, when you talk about DC films, it's always like this negativity of, oh, it's a DC film. It's not going to do as well. That's not happening in this case. (laughs) People are really stoked for this. And I do think the DC movie lineup, like Black Adam and stuff like that that's coming up, I think we're going to see, we got an Aquaman movie. People, I think, are going to be really interested in seeing these films. So I think this is a very good time for us as DC fans to just really enjoy the film output that's coming up and get excited for what's coming down the pipe. Because I, I don't think this isn't a DC versus Marvel thing. This is just we got cool stuff coming. And good movies are good movies. Yes. I, I want to enjoy myself. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, between the two of us, I'm always a little bit more leery about being in public. And I'm looking for, I wanted to see this 100% in the movie theater. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm doing this. You know, we, we had the chance to, to go to a live wrestling event, and I felt okay afterwards. And I was a little uncomfortable some periods of times. But as a general rule, I was good to go. So I'm all set for this movie thing here. And I 100%. It's funny. I'm done watching trailers for it because yep. I'm yep. worried they're going to do the stupid thing and reveal something that I'm like, oh, dang it. I would have rather seen that live. So I'm now – at the point where I stop watching all trailers because I'm worried they're going to give me a glimpse of, you know, like they'll show Superman in it or something like that. I'm like, come on, guys. That's a surprise. That should have been a surprise. This is almost a three-hour movie. I don't Mm -hmm. think they can show us too much. (laughs) Because it's two hours and 55 minutes is the running time. Dude, that's awesome. And I'm so glad that they're doing that and not saying, oh, we got to have it cut it out. No, you don't. Yeah. You know, the people who like these movies don't mind a long movie as long as it's as long as you're giving us something for the long movies. If you give us a 15 minute diatribe of absolutely nothing, guess what? Then people will say, "Eh, that's a little long." But when you get you know when you give me a meaty movie, but make it not just long, but giving me substance to it, I'll sit through it. I think the you know Justice League. Um, you know, movie, you know, yep. with, you know, how the, the Snyderverse came out. Oh, that was too long. No, that was a great, that was a great length. I love watching it. I would have seen that in the movie theaters, you know, but because again, it was a good solid movie. Yeah, it was long, but it was a good solid movie. So it, it's, I think, you know, they're learning this and I think they're, they're starting to get the grasp of, you know, we, you know, the Hollywood, you know, machine is understanding you know, the different audiences do different things. Lord of the Rings was this that massive epic movie. Fan, the Lord of the Rings fans had no problem with it whatsoever. Oh yeah, I think that's a great example. I think story's got to be the deciding factor as far as what. Here's what you can't do: don't cut out so many scenes that now the movie is unrecognizable. You know, as far as the original vision, uh, I a, a quality. I'd rather go to a quality three-hour movie than a hacked-up two-hour movie. Yep. 
runtime is one of those things where you've got to make... I, I think there's sometimes movies that go too long where they have to make the judicious choice of saying, okay, we've got about 15, 20 minutes here that need to be snipped because, truthfully, they do nothing to progress the story. And for the interest of keeping a concise, you know, inter, you know, move it, keep the story moving, let's cut some of those scenes out. And those are best used as deleted scenes because I love seeing that stuff after the fact. But don't hack up a movie so bad that now you've made a movie, make the story unrecognizable. Yeah. So, I don't know, this is two hours and 47 minutes, but it looks like, with uh, without the credits. And I'm like, all right, that's great. They're just... I, I don't, everything so far looks so good with this. I'm I've got a lot of confidence in this film. I'm just, I want this to be I want this to be great. I hope hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> we are crystal men from Mercury. We have no quarrel with you. Our discussions got me on. I am Batman issue number six. Empire State of Mind Part One. Uh, the writer is John Ridley. R I D L E Y. I'm assuming it's written. Rid- Ridley. Yeah. Um, artist is Ken Lashley. Uh, Rex Locus is colors. Troy, yeah, Troy Petrie is letters. Oliveri Copley, C O I P E L, and Alex Sinclair on covers. Francisco Matina and Carrie uh, Randolph and em- Emilio Lopez on the variant covers. And Alexis Franklin on the Black History Month variant cover. Dave Wilgos is the associate editor. Ben Abernathy is editor. And of course, Batman was created. By Bob Kane with Bill Finger. And as always with Jim, apologies on name butchery there, folks. This is a great book. And it's funny, we were talking a long time ago about our hopes for Jace. And I think we both wound up with some, if you put both of our interests together, came up with a book. I think this satisfyingly gave Jace a new status quo that kind of dealt with everything we were both hoping for for the character and didn't realize they were going to do. I love this. This this approach is great. I was not expecting a number of the things that they did in this issue or, you know, as they were transitioning into this. What do you think about Jace? What do you think about his new status quo being in New York and how he's interacting with New York in general? What do you think about this? Dude, I'll tell you, I'm loving this. I'm absolutely loving this. I'm glad he's in uh, New York City. I think it's, yeah, granted, it'd be better if he was in Cleveland, but, you know, <laughs> hey, New York is a good second fiddle to Cleveland. That works. Um, but seriously, though, it, it it was a really cool way he came there, you know, with his sister, you know, and then even just the, like, like last issue when they announced where he was going, they were dropping little hints along the way. You should have immediately realized it when they said, you know, when the sister needed to go to the best specialist was in New York. And then the one detective gets transferred to New York. You know, I'm like, oh, OK. And then, oh, he's in New York City. There you go. That's why. You know, and it was a neat way they handled it, how he got moved over there and why he's operating here. And even just, again, Jace is being his own Batman. Yep. And I like the fact that, you know, it was even with his discussion with his, uh, you know, with his father about take off the face plane. Don't hide who you are. And I thought that for me was a really cool moment that it came from his dad telling him to do that. You know, and just be you are Batman. You know, it's not the other Batman or the New York Batman. He is Batman. And it goes back to, again, the title of the book. I am Batman. And I really do enjoy just his persona, his characterization, and his way of handling it. You know, like there's that one scene in there where he's driving the motorcycle, he sees the kid who's taking a picture, and he, you know, flashes, you know, the peace symbol to the kid. You know, this Batman is not camera shot. This Batman doesn't hide in the shadows. This Batman is letting people know, hey, this is who I am. You know, I think that is a cool thing. It reminds me of when Dick Grayson wore the mantle. You know, he had the same kind of mindset where that that was the Batman who actually looked like he was having fun while doing it. So this Batman has his own style, his own his own persona. You know, yes, he is Batman, but it's him. You know, and I, I really do enjoy what they're doing with him, how they're doing it. And I especially love the fact that the mayor's like deputize him. Let's use him. You know? Let's do this differently than how Gotham did it. And I thought that was absolutely perfect. Well, and they're trying to do that to control him. So that's going to be an interesting sort of dynamic, too. It's not it's not being done for benevolent reasons. It's uh, we don't want him 
running the show. We need to run the show. And the only way to get him under control is to get him under our thumb. It was. It, I love that approach. It was really, really cool the way that they did that. I'm like, okay, I get what they're doing here. This is a very, very cool approach to the series, approach to the character. It sets up a political government that operates different. It's bigger, you know, the big city, New York. Uh, they don't want another Gotham. They don't want to be Gotham, and they're they're approaching this very, very differently. And it's either he joins us or we're taking him down, and we're taking yeah. him down fast. Uh, so. That that kind of do or die kind of thing is is pretty critical here, and I like it. Well, I, the one line from the book that I absolutely loved was when the mayor had his old his powwow going, and the commissioner's like, "We get a squad together, we hunt them down, we take them out, and this and that." And the mayor just combats with, "So to be clear, commissioner, in a world we currently live in, you know, we find ourselves living in, you order a posse of police officers to hunt down and kill an unarmed black man who is exercising his constitutional rights to intervene in felonies as they are being committed." I love that line. Yep. I absolutely love that because again, it really it shows just the you know it shows the political intrigue. It shows just the intelligence. It shows everything that's going on in the current universe. Where you know I absolutely love that you know scenario. Now and contemporary, know, it's very contemporary to today yes. too. I love when comics touch on social issues and start to just bring awareness and start getting you thinking and talking. And this book, it's it's bold. I really love that this book is bold and edgy in yes. what it's doing and and edgy in a in a really smart way. I I really this as this character's unfolded in the way that they've been gradually rolling out the character of Jace. Wow, has this become a favorite book of mine? I I'm very protective of Bruce and love Bruce as Batman, but here's the thing. I will say consistently, one of the things and I think you and I both really have been doing this Neither of us have been saying we didn't want Jace as Batman. Right. We wanted a way for this to work. Boy, was this issue exactly what, like, it was what I was hoping for without knowing that this is what I was hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> I liked the idea, too, when uh, Lucius was talking to him about removing the faceplate, which, if you had asked me one of the things that I liked about Jace's outfit, I actually thought the faceplate was cool. And I would have said, if you had asked me, would you make any adjustments to the costume? No, I like Jace's costume. Second, Lucius explained why. I'm like, oh, he's right. <laughs> Go, Lucius. I'm like, get that face blaze off of there. It makes total sense. I love that he had to shave because of it. And, you know, he's presenting himself in a whole different way. But it goes back... Like, that whole line wouldn't have been possible if that faceplate was still on there. So right. I really love that there's a storytelling reason for, you know, people know that this is not the same Batman that operates in Gotham. But he's Batman. And it's an interesting sort of piece that he's he's combating, too, the fact that getting people to take him seriously as Batman or understand him as Batman uh, is is a new challenge for him. And I love that. What a great approach to this. Embrace it. And, you know, and, and as we as readers go along with it and feel that it's a smart, well-handled story as well. Yeah. And it's funny because I've always, I, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I've said and I've you know, heard people say about with the Bat costume, how he's got that wide open area. Yep. You know, he, he could be so completely armored up, but no, he's always has that face open. So when Jace was doing it, he was covered. And he's completely armored up. But again, as, as you said, as you said, it's it makes sense why they did it. It was again, it was perfect. That it was from Lucius telling him to do that. You know, and it, you know, it's one of those things where I'm really it's little small pieces like that of this story. That's what's making me really enjoy it. Like, I like the fact that the Foxes are also billionaires. They've got all that money. They bought all that resources. And I do like the fact that Jace is uncomfortable being in billionaire row in Manhattan. Yeah. He would be more comfortable in, you know, some of the other boroughs. He'd be more comfortable, you know, not with the, you know, the upper elite, you know, especially given what he wants to do, given his bat, given the role of the bat. You kind of don't need so many eyes around you or don't need all that, you know, securities monitoring your income, your coming and going. So I do like the fact that he's uncomfortable with it, but he's sticking around. He's he's there for the family. This isn't about just being back. This is about being his family. This is, you know, there's more to, again, it's, there's more to this, more to him than just the cow. He has a life. And I like the fact that we're having, we're seeing his life in and out of the costume. 
You know, we always talk about how, you know, with a good Batman story, Gotham City has to be a part of it. And Gordon and the police force and all these other supporting characters. Alfred was always one of those things. We said we need to have these for a good, solid Bat story. Well, with this Batman story, we need that same stuff. We need that supporting characters. We need that, you know, just beyond just the Bat. We need more than just one person. You know, and I like the fact that they're taking their time and they are building up his support team. They've had his he had he's bringing in his technical support. We've got this cool stories going on with the police department now, how they're building up their stories. And we're starting to see some super uh, villains come his way. So they're taking their time. And it's you know, we're six issues in and we're really now starting to build on the Batman. You know, this Jace Batman. You start speaking about things like him developing villains. Let's talk about the villain in this one, because there's a level of creepy. You've got this artist who's like painting on this canvas with this guy's finger. (laughs) I mean, that's what we start off the issue with. And we've got this, you know, high profile philanthropist that is... Is being used as, I guess, a make something beautiful, Sean. Making yes. something beautiful, yeah. making the world pretty. <laughs> it, it, it really, you know, at the end of the issue, you get to see that pretty moment where we got. Yeah. Now she has left Gotham, and it's like, oh man, like this is the this is the kind of craziness that comes with Batman. So you've got somebody who's already not sure how she feels about masks in general. She's got to bring her partner with her, who's a little bit more pro mask than she is. But it's an interesting sort of relationship because she's not a believer uh, in the whole vigilante mass thing. She thinks that, you know, Batman being here is the reason why this is ramping up. Yeah. Which, timing-wise, is not true. This is, it's just, it's coincidental, unfortunately, that Batman's showing up on the scene and this level of crazy is already going on. So she's inaccurate in that, which is interesting. We as readers know that. Like, he showed up, he didn't cause this guy. This guy was already here. If he, if he picked this up, he picked it up with what's going on in Gotham, not because Jace is in New York, that's for sure. And I like the fact that they're using it as part of the story because oh, it's yeah. something that people have said multiple times. Are the crazies in Gotham because it's Gotham or are they there because of Batman? You know, did Batman create the need for, you know, the 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 super the the the, vil, the super villain, the crazy villain, the, the the villain that's a little bit over the edge that's just not a mob boss. You know, did Batman create that need? You know, and you, you think back to that one uh, Batman story that we had where they were talking about the, you know, uh, you know the, the blade, uh, the blade, not the blade, the scimitar, yeah. you know, uh, you know, that guy, how he, when he first was robbing the bank, everyone's like, oh, yeah, okay, you need to have a gimmick in Gotham, you know, and when he had that big blade, okay, now he's got a gimmick, yes, now I'm going to treat him real, <laughs> you know, and it's, there is that whole connection, but it is funny how, this the artist was already there. He was already doing his thing. Batman just showing up is maybe going to escalate it to another level, maybe. Yeah. But he was already there. He they already had their serial killer. So I, I, again, creepy serial, creepy people using human bodies as artwork is an awesome villain. Yeah, you know, and I want to see how Jace would deal with it. Bruce would handle it one way. Jace is going to handle it a different way. He's not. The detective that uh, Bruce is, he's got smarts to him and he does have some you know, good intelligence and with the deductive reasoning and some detective skills, but he's not Bruce. So I want to see how Jace handles this. Jace is real interesting because we get a chance to really see him in this one and see his outfit. I love that his suit is a little different than Bruce's. We much more emphasis on combat armor. You know, versus Bruce's suit, uh, I think, you know, showing just like a next generation level of, you know, very clear armor design on the front of it. But yet doesn't change his ability to use tactical fighting, tactical skills, things like that. It's, you know, it's very motion sensitive, but it's it's a very clear armored suit um, that I think does distinguish itself from Bruce's. Yet very believable that this guy is just as big as Bruce, you know, just as powerful as Bruce, just as threatening as Bruce. 
in his combat styling as well, which is something that I really like. Where you've seen, you mentioned when Dick Grayson was Batman before, there were some size differences between the two, noticeably so because Dick is more lean in yeah. in his uh, approach. And I actually, I actually like those distinctions. This one, I like that they're not trying to make him the Dick Grayson Batman. They're not trying to make him the Bruce Batman. Like you said, we're getting a, a very different Jace Batman. I love the mo- use of the motorcycle in this and just... Uh, Jace's whole approach. This is more and more. We hear rumors all the time of uh, a black Batman being put on screen. I don't know how accurate those rumors are, how true those rumors are. If it's going to be this Batman, I want to see that movie stat. Oh, big time. Big time. And it's funny because you talk about fighting styles, you know, like Dick Grayson, he has an acrobatic style to his fighting. So when he was Batman, he had a more acrobatic style. Bruce has that traditional, you know, jujitsu, martial arts kind of style. Jace is MMA, you know, and the difference is, yeah, it is a martial arts, but it's more of strike. It's more of a strike combat. You know, it's rapid fire. It's hard hits. It's, you know, then as you need to, you pop, you know, you you pop in a controlling arm bar or or a lock or something like that. Bruce, it's... It's a different style than Bruce has. And I think that's one thing that they've done really good with showing Jace's combat styling versus Bruce's styling. Yeah. Now, and they both, they're both very intimidating because they both will hurt you. But it's, you know, Bruce's, because of his extensive studying and his extensive training, he's got times when he goes into like a beast mode. You know? yes. And then he's got times when it's more artistic. You know, Jace has that pure, you know, he's got that, as I said, MMA background, that MMA style training. So it is more of a hard hitting, more of a pound you, you know, to the ground kind of uh, styling to it. I think it, again, it works well for him. It works great for his background and it does give a cool look, you know, and a different feel to this character. And I'm glad they're personalizing it to Jace. They're not trying to make him like Bruce or trying to make him like uh, Dick with the costume. He is who he is, and this is how he's got to play it. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's uh, this. This series is is endlessly surprising me, and that's something that I'm I'm really enjoying out of it. It's this Empire State of Mind. I think I'm glad Fear State's over because, and I mean, I loved Fear State. But I feel like now this has been a license for Jace to flourish, you know, and and be able to really be developed as his own character. Uh, I think this is really important at this point. Get him out of Gotham and get him to his own team, get him um, his own cast of characters, get him his own way of operating. I actually love the fact that he's in New York because of the fact that you don't have to put in some of the tropes of Gotham into it. Let's embrace the fact that we can really develop New York in in D.C. the way that we really want to and embrace it and develop some new villains and develop a new supporting cast, develop new police officers, develop Team Jace, which is happening in this, and his family, being able to see more of them. Because I think the family's been a winner all the way through the entire story of Jace. It's been really great to see his interactions with his family. And that's something that I've really grown to appreciate about this as well is the fact that uh, John really just done a really just a great job of I think great creating a book that overall I just really enjoy. Oh yeah, yeah. And the thing I'm wondering is uh Detective uh Chubb with her cuz like as we said before she's got that issues with the masks but it's it's one of those things when you're in Gotham it's you deal with it differently. And sure. we see this, you know, with the artist now and she's like, "Oh god, it's continuing." Do you see them evolving her character into more like the Gordon esque role, or keeping her where she's at, where she, you know, you know, in a way, she's kind of like how Bullock was. You know, Bullock, you know, does not like the masks, but he recognizes they do some good. Or is, whereas Gordon is one hundred percent was one hundred percent pro mask. Do you see their, them evolving her to Gordon or Bullock? I don't know, and, and I think her partner is going to be a key to that. Um, what is his relationship going to be with Batman? Because we've already seen that they have a relationship of sorts. Mm-hmm. So, you know, or at least due to circumstances during Fear State and things like that, they started to develop a relationship. So what is that going to be like now in New York? Uh, I think what's intriguing about it is you're posing, I think, possibilities. 
it's always fun to read a story where you know there's possibilities that can play out. Uh, I don't have a preference with any of that. Uh, I don't know. I think what's intriguing about her is that she's not out of the starting gate, Gordon. She's also not Bullock, but I, your linkage to Bullock is, I, I think what you're trying to do is saying she's kind of like a hybrid of the two in, in yeah. many ways, which is, makes her intriguing. And you could see that tilting one way or the other. It's going to make their relationship a very unique one. And also, how re, how in is she going to be on what the mayor's doing? What what level of ethics is really going on in the politics in New York, in D.C.? So those are pieces that, as they unfold, I think we're going to have greater answers in all of this. Uh, I I love that right now, um, all bets are off. And it's going to be very interesting to see how all of these, because it isn't, to your point, it's not just about Jace. It's about the supporting cast. Really getting to know them and really getting to see them grow along the way. That's going to be the fun of the story. I'd like to see them have a, a partnership of sorts down the road, but what way is there going to be that partnership? Is it going to be really that Batman's re- interacting more with her partner than her? Who knows? Yeah, well, and you add to the fact of the you know the commissioner obviously doesn't like him, right. and the deputy mayor Carmichael, who's in charge of this uh, special task force, is got his own political you know intrigue kind of you know coup planned and all that stuff and and as these two are meeting who's but you know who's overhead watching them the artist right so now is he connected or or she we don't know if artist is a male or female yet but you know are they connected to either of these two right right you know because initially it was funny because initially i was thinking that carmichael may have been the actual artist and it wasn't until seeing you know seeing them watch over Carmichael. Okay, he's not the he's not the main bad. It's somebody else, you know. But again, it does make you wonder: Is he connected to the camp? Is this going to be something further? I don't know. And it, it's it's one of those things where I like when stories do this with do the too. background. Again, as you said, the supporting character they're building up, so it's not just about Jace and not just about Jace's family. We've got all this other stuff coming through, and the identity of the artist, or even a name for the artist. You got to give. Uh, I'm calling them the artist, but we need a name for them. You know, we'll let somebody else name them. But again, it is kind of cool how they're building all this stuff together, and they're inter weaving it together. So it's not just a simple creepy Batman villain. There's going to be something more to them. Yeah, and it's only the first villain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, who, who knows what else New York is going to throw at them? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I, I like the blank canvas because this is where, you know, when you start to justify, like, why does this Batman need a movie? Why does this Batman need a TV series or whatever? It's because of the fact that you're developing a story that, yes, it has, it's inspired by Batman. But it's one of the things I'm enjoying about Batwoman this season. Uh, I don't know if, if you've watched any of uh, the new Batwoman, but... I really love that it's because of the fact that they had to step away from Kate Kane because of needing to recast. It, it let that series breathe and go in a new direction. And I love the character of Kate Kane. I mean, I'm a big fan of that character in the comics and everything. But this change allowed this that series to do a lot of what this book's doing. And I think it's a great thing. I think it's really, really cool that there's this idea of, well, what if, what if we're in a world where these characters are inspired by Batman or these characters are inspired by Batwoman. Yeah. What is, and, and they have a chance though, to interpret that in their own way and have that influenced by their own background, their own backstory, their, their friends, uh, the people that they've interacted with good and bad experiences that they've had in their life. It makes a book rich and intriguing. This book has really grown on me and it went very quickly from being a, like, uh, another bat title and i don't say that i love another bat title i'm give me more is kind of my thing to being something that it's it almost feels like it's not fair to call this a bat title because of the fact that it's got its own little unique it reminds me of i guess and i want to be careful saying this because i don't want to make it look like i'm diminishing any it reminds me of what i loved about asriel when asriel branched out to be its own title and Denny O'Neill really got a chance to run with the character in its in its solo series 
I really became a big fan of that book, and I like his writing a lot. It's, it's stuff that I liked about his writing on books like The Question and things like that. This has that flavor where this is just different <laughs> in, in a really, really, yeah. really rich and good way. And I don't, I almost, I'm afraid to label it a bat book. Like, I, I'd be happy to see it cross over into bat titles and things like that. Sure, that'd be kind of cool. If they don't ever do that, or, you know, there's very minimal reason to do that, that's completely cool too because this is my favorite issue. And I think what I love the most about it is this is the chance where it really got a chance to go hog wild and just yeah. be. I am Batman. Just really be, be his own, I yeah, am Batman. Be his own boss. You yeah. Know? yeah. And I, it's funny. I agree with you on how I love the fact that he is Batman. Mm-hmm. Flat out love it. You know, but th- there is that part of me that, you know, would want him to have his own code name, but they don't need to do that. No. He's defining himself enough that he is, he is Batman. Yep. You know, he doesn't need to be called, you know, you know, night dude or whatever i don't know you know some other name he doesn't need a different name but there is that i could see if they were later on were to say hey we're going to give him his own code name i i wouldn't have a problem with it because he is such his own hero but like on the other it's, it's one of those weird things where i'm like i say Wait, one thing then i say so, the exact well, opposite i was just going to say to you here's the because thing i'm so comfortable with him as batman if they but, but here's the thing if they announce next month we're changing jace's name to night dude or something i mean like yeah, let's let's yeah. give it now let's say and take Night Dude out of it. It's a cool yeah. name. Tell me you wouldn't be a little disappointed. I, I, it's one of those I would be, but I wouldn't be. You know, because again, if they gave him I a would really be. cool I, name. I'll tell you right now. I'm going to say I would be. You know, I, here's the, it's the funny part. I would be. And because of the fact that they've done everything that I wanted them to do. Instead of taking Bruce's spot, they gave him his own. Right. So now and when I'm reading I Am Batman, I'm like, yeah. you know what? This dude is Batman. <laughs> yes. And, and again, that's why I would – it's – you know, why I would be upset is because they, they really did a great job making him Batman. He's 100% Batman. But then the flip side of it would be there – you know, where you would – you know, you would say they're honoring him as a hero by giving him his own identity. Then I'd be like, okay, I don't have a problem with that. It's kind of like me and Damien. I love the fact that Damien is Robin. Mm-hmm. You know, but if later on, if Damien were to claim a different title other than Robin, other than Batman, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with it. It was like when Nightwing, you know, when Dick Grayson crossed over and became Nightwing, you know, because he wasn't Robin anymore. I think, you know, that's kind of like the just that mindset, you know, that I that idea. Whereas Again, if they don't do it, I'm cool with it because I love him as Batman. I love the fact that he calls himself Batman and why he is Batman because he actually is 100% Batman. I don't put the other in front of him. I no. don't put any New York designation or anything. He is Batman. But again, and if they changed it, I would be upset that we lose that. But I would also then look at the fact that they're doing it to honor him as a hero, giving him his own name. I 110% thought I was going to be of the camp that I want him to be something else other than Batman. I And I, I'll openly say that. I thought I was going to be all in on, you know, I, I love Jace, I love the character, yeah. but I ultimately want him to be something else other than this. I am completely shocked because I am 110% in the camp that this guy is Batman. They, and I got to commend John Ridley and really the whole creative who've put this together because they made me a believer. I'm like really, uh, which I'm a Bruce guy. I mean, 110% a Bruce guy and they've managed to find a way to make me go, Oh no, I want him. He's got to be Batman. He's got to be Batman. Every, (laughs) any other option of this is wrong other than him being Batman. And I'm nobody's more shocked at me feeling that way than me. No, and again, it's one of those things. I completely agree with you, one hundred percent. I, I, um, I, I do love the fact that he is Batman. And if they were to change it, I would have, I would have an upset for it, you know. But it would be something I would get over. Oh, sure. Because they're honoring him as a hero, and that would be the whole. Now, if they changed it, as I said, to something stupid, then I would be upset, one hundred percent. No, you know, no. Thing of honoring it, you know, the hero. That's I'm like, that's a stupid move, guys. You, you are good to go. Now, if they come up with a, something cool, they come up with a story wise behind it, all that kind of stuff, then I would be okay with it. I would be upset that we're 
they're taking the mantle from him because he's to me he's earned the right to call himself Batman. And this story has they've created says yes, this is one hundred percent Batman. And I love that. And again, it's one of it's 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 one of those things where I say one sentence and I say the exact opposite immediately after. I understand I'm doing that, but it's it's here's, it's one of those mindsets where I can see both sides of the argument. Here's the here's my my, prefer, my preference is keeping him as Batman. Just clarify that. One hundred percent preference is keeping him Batman. We're leaving so, something we're leaving something critical out of this though. Yeah. If you start naming him Batwing, we've already got Luke Fox. Right. So now what we're going to do is have yet another Fox family member who is who's a bat guy who is not Batman. It just to me it's like why did we create Jace? What is the reason for Jace? Why not Luke? Cuz for a while there we thought it might be Luke that was going to be this guy. So to me the distinction of having it be Jace is uh, Jace is not Batwing. Luke's Batwing. And uh, seeing Jace and Luke maybe team up at some point in time and like That'd really be... embrace it, which would be really cool with him as Batwing, I think that would be way cool because uh, I, I love Luke. But the dis- the difference is why is Jace different? Why did he need to be created? We needed to show the reason why this guy needed to be Batman, not Batwing, not Batmite, not Bat Bat Anything. Kind. Bat yeah. Knight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's he really needs to be his own Batman, and this I think this issue is where they nailed it. And they, I, it's I never thought I'd be the one that was so defensive of him being Batman. I am now. I really like him as Batman. I mean, this is way totally unexpected, and I think that's a testament to this. And I, we're not really on different pages on this one. No. It's it's interesting in debating about this character because I was very much of the camp of, I don't know, I'm Bruce first, yay Bruce, <laughs> and I'm still that way, but what they've shown me is you don't need to think that. <laughs> you, you get the right team, we can, you get the right creative team, and they can convince, they can show you, see, this is what we're talking about. And again, 100% extreme kudos to this creative team for creating this character that yep. I absolutely love. And I 100% want to see him as Batman. Yep. You know, 100% want to see that. You know, so, again, I'm happy with what we're getting. You know, and like you, I was in the camp very initially, like, hey, they need they should give him a different name. After everything clears up, give him his new city and give him a different name. That was, was 100% my mindset before. Now, again, because that was my mindset, if they went that route, I probably could understand it. But I 100% love him as Batman. 100% want to see him stay as Batman and not have a, a separate designation. He is Batman. I just want to make sure 100% clear on that. Yeah, it's this is fun. This is yeah. really, really fun. Nice work, Adam. What are these characters up to? Our next discussion is going to be of Task Force Z, Chapter 4. Matthew Rosenberg on script, Eddie Barrows and Kieran McCown on pencils, Eber Ferreira and Dexter Vines on inks, Adriana Lucas on colors, Rob Lay letters, Barrows, Ferreira, and Lucas on cover, Riley pa- Rosmo and Arif Pritano, and Dave Schonenberg on the variant covers, Dan Mora, Peacemaker variant cover, Dave Wielgos, associate editor, Paul Kaminsky is the editor, and Ben Abernathy is the group editor, Task Force Z, created by a severe <laughs> lack of sleep. I, love, I, had to read that, I just love that. It's interesting uh, to talk about this book, and apologies for any name butchery, because this was one that I've been wanting to read, wanting to read, wanting to read, and it's one that I put on the slate for the show because I wanted to read it. I kind of thought I knew what the premise was going to be of it, but because I hadn't read it yet, I didn't really know. I I kind of felt there would be like some form of zombie thing, you know, associated with it, just from what I was seeing from cover previews and things. I loved that I ran into this one and and kind of knew, but then what they delivered was so much dramatically more, different, <laughs> so much more than what I well. It, there is a zombie ish element to it, but like it's a DC approach to zombies. This book I dig, and this is an ongoing, right? This isn't a. I'm not seeing limited series somewhere. Am I missing something? No, I'm not seeing. Blanco, you know, four of 12 or anything like that. That's just episode, issue four right there on the cover. There's no indicator indication that this is a limited series. So this is an ongoing. And I'm very, it, it, it's funny when Task Force Z, I immediately assume zombie. 
Eagles. Yeah. Immediately assumed it. And I assumed it was going to be an alternate Earth kind of you know thing. But they did that deceased. And I'm like, is this something that's going off a of deceased? Or I was trying to figure out what it was. I didn't I never even remotely thought it would be DC Universe proper. Now I was one hundred percent thinking Elseworlds. But then you know, start reading, I'm like, okay, no, this is DC proper. I'm like, okay, what are they doing with this? Because I was assuming they're going to use this as a way to bring back some of the dead villains. And Bane is obvious, is 100% the one I was thinking they would use to bring him back. You know, and then I was also thinking, hmm, I wonder if they could use this to bring back Alfred. You know, and those are the kind of stuff that I was, you know, throwing through my head. But, you know, as the series started going on, you, you start reading it. And I start, it was funny because issue one, I was like, ah, okay, this is pretty cool. This is interesting. By, by issue four, I'm like, oh, I'm loving this book. <laughs> well, and the interesting part is, so they're using a, a form of the Lazarus pit, you know, to, to bring these characters back, these dead, deceased villains. But their way they're doing, there's some real ethical considerations because they were using dosages initially that were keeping them as close to zombies as possible so they were more controllable so that their more dominant personality traits didn't take over and they could wrangle them in. But also, they had them aware enough that they were being brought back so there was an incentive for them to keep thirsting for that that sustenance that they were getting from the pills that was giving them a, a little bit of a closer feel of life. So they were craving it and needing it for a lot of reasons. And you see it over there and, and see that some are more coherent than the others. Um, Lady, you know, the Arkham, uh, Arkham Knight yes. being Arkham brought Knight. into all this. Um, I love that Bloom is not like Bloom's not there because Bloom's a zombie. Bloom's been nerfed and Bloom's kind of uh, almost a chaotic element in this whole thing. <laughs> The whole team is just, Ban Bat being a part of this, the whole team is just really outstanding. And Red Hood being front and center in this, you could not pick a a Batman hero-ish, uh, you know, Jason's always kind of skirts that crazy line, but who is going through this time where he's like, he's trying to get away from killing. He's heading in a new direction, as we've seen. And he evolves into this one where he's seeing... He's came come back to life this way. You know, he's been through the Lazarus pit. So he has a greater understanding of what they're going through. And they're almost being tortured with life. Deadshot, the whole sequence with Deadshot, I thought was just outstanding. You know, where Deadshot's brought back and he's like, dude, why would you think I'd want this? Like, who would want this? Because he looks terrible. Yes. And it's it's not a form of living. And he's basically calling Jason out and going, you knew I wouldn't want this too. And you just didn't care. And I love that element of this whole thing, you know, where there's some real honest, hard hitting, ethical discussions on, t on play here, along with some great action and, and some moments that are just stunning. We haven't even gotten into one of the other big reveals yet, but I mean, just talking about the team in general that's on there is something that's great. And I'll tell you, I loved how Bane was a part of it. Yep. And then how Jason had his issues with Bane. You know, and it was funny because it took me a second to realize why Jason really hated Bane. I was like, oh, okay, it's Bane. And then I'm like, oh, no, it's not. And they even brought it up. Yep. Because when, you know, Jason's like, he killed someone very close to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's Alfred. And then later on in that same issue... He's like, you know, when, when Jason's torturing Bane, he goes, you know why I'm doing this? He's like, yes, say his name, Alfred Pennyworth. Ah! You know? I was like, oh, man. I, I tell you, I cheered at that moment. I absolutely just cheered out loud for that one. That was absolutely just brilliant. Do you think Bane's done? No. Bane is very hard to kill. Now, Bane, you know, even zombie Bane is hard to kill. And it's... They're, you know, they have the the new the new Bane that's going on in the Joker series. I'm behind on it, so I don't know what her status is. You've got this Bane who can always come back. You know, the the main thing they were saying as long as the head is not as long as the brain is not damaged, right? They can come back. So you know, Bane fell off a, a building. So if he landed feet first, in you know, which he would have known, he had enough of his intelligence to know he would have done that. His brain may still be intact. So we may see Bane later on. 
Yeah. So let's get to the reveal. Crispin is really Two Face. Yeah. I did not see that coming, and what? A, nope. But yet, it was one of those reveals where you're like, "All right, I didn't see this coming." But not only is it way cool, but it also makes sense. Yes. And I love that we've got you know Harvey Dent's more in control of the situation, but you get you know where like. Harvey's view of the world will have changed because of his own experiences. And I'm like, wow, I'm loving that all of that just makes so much sense. There was not an element of it where I was like, oh, that's kind of far-fetched or that doesn't make sense. Why would Harvey do that or anything like that? I'm like, oh, no, I get it. I get what Harvey's doing and I, I get why this is a thing. And I loved that. I absolutely loved the way that they handled Harvey Dent in this. Uh, it's not something I would have ever... You know, if you said, who do you think it's going to be? He wouldn't have been on a li- short, he wouldn't have been on any list, much less a short list of no, people that I would have suggested. 100%. And I like the fact that they really didn't have like the two motif um, clues out there. Yeah. yeah. The closest thing they ever came was that they said he likes to give people a second chance. And even that wasn't a clue as the Two Face because right. it's not Two Face. This isn't Two Face. This is Harvey Dent doing it. There's no coin flip. There's no none of that. This is actually Harvey Dent in control of the body, trying to make atones for what he did while two, being Two Faced. I like that. I like that designation. I like that the fact that we get that, and I hope it stays that way. Jason and Batman interacting was really great because it's the typical Jason and Batman relationship where Bruce is like, "I sent you in." And I'm pulling you out now. This is getting to be too dangerous. And Jason's like, listen, I don't work for you. I, you know, I'm yeah. kind of, I'm still, I'm not done here. There's a lot more for me to do. And I'm going to, you know, keep moving forward with it. The interactions between the two of them, I thought were very, very well written. It was very much a, a Batman. And I love mo- any moments that we get with Batman and Jason. I just are gold. Um, and Matthew Rosenberg totally gets the idea of how to write these two interacting with each other. And boy, is this, Eddie Barrows is an a artist who, he, he does not get enough credit for the quality of his work. Every book that Eddie Barrows is on is just a very good looking book. And the action sequences are always outstanding. Oh, big time. And it's funny, the fight sequence that we got going on, and I did air quotes around fight because they really have no chance of the the three muggers up against Batman versus uh, Red Hood. (laughs) Again, brilliant action going on. And I love the fact that really these two guys, these three guys have no shot whatsoever. And they turn to run and one guy's like, I'm not fighting Batman. Wrong answer. He's the nice one. (laughs) Now, an interesting part is that uh, our two little twins who were helping out with uh, the chop shop are actually triplets. Yeah. Who have died. <laughs> and we get to see the third sister in this issue, which I thought was really interesting to see that she's on the opposing side and does not know that her sisters are, quote unquote, alive. So that's a whole other dynamic twist. It's like every corner that we turn in this, there's another layer of deception. There's another piece of um, ethics that have been left out on the table. And you've got a question, like, who should I really be rooting for in this scenario? This is some stuff that, like, boy, Amanda Waller can be nasty. This has got that, like, level of, like, real conspiracy nasty that I I find intriguing when they pull them in in books like this. It's this is very different than anything else that I'm reading right now. It's one of the reasons why I was I, I literally when I got done with issue four, I was looking at the front. I'm like, this isn't a mini series, is it? Because I don't want it to be one. I want to keep reading this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you add the wall to any story, and I'm happy because sure. the wall is awesome. And I love the fact that how again, as you said, with the the two uh, twins are really triplets. And I'll be honest, I don't think they're air quotes alive. I think they're actually back to being full on alive now. Because that's part of the thing with the Lazarus resin. If you get enough of it, you 100% come back fully. Like if a couple issues back, Jason died, and they gave him a full-on injection, and now he's back. Well, He's not taking pills to stay into his existence. Well, I think if you give enough, you fully recover. Now, here, wait, wait. Do we know for sure they gave him a full amount? I'm assuming because we've never seen him jones for pills. Well, yet. Yet, true. 
Here's the thing. I I don't trust anybody in this. What better way to control? Like, here's the thing. Those, the twins that are back, were they given a full dose or are they being controlled? True. Could be. Those are, easily, qu- those are yeah, questions. That's... Those are questions that I have here because here's the thing we've seen. This, the, this Lazarus resin is being used to control people and really to get, you know, the, the greater good quote in quotes yeah. is driving decision-making as far as how people are controlled in this. So, I, was Jason brought back fully? I don't know. I think you're right. I'm not, and th- before we be clear, I think you're right. But there's that part of me that's like, but do we know the whole story? I do, and that's that's where I love that there's a layer in this that I don't trust everything that I'm seeing. Yeah, and I think that makes for an intriguing story because this is really the, if there's one thing I will say that's going to be true about this book. I don't know who you can trust. And True. that that part makes this book really fun. Oh, big time. And it's funny because as you're talking, I'm nodding my head going, yes, I agree with you. And here's the funny thing. If this if Task Force Z was run by the wall, I 100% would think they weren't given a full dose. Right. I would 100% think Jason wasn't given a full dose. But because it's run by Harvey Dent, not Two-Face, I well, think they were. But again... I still wouldn't be shocked to find out later that they weren't because we're that's the, that moral ambiguity we're getting in this book is really cool, especially all the sequences with Bloom have been outstanding. You know where he takes Man Bat, gives him the injection to bring back you know the human, talks to the human, gives him enough just so he remembers it and goes, oh wait, let's bring back the bat, <laughs> you know, and gives him back the injection and bring back Zombie Bat. You know, that for me, that character is absolutely brilliant in this. And it's one of those things where you've got this, you know, oh, my God, what are they doing? Kind of this sickens me to this is really cool story. And it so fits in with Task Force Sex, Suicide Squad, Amanda Waller, that I'm like, this is such a great book that I want to keep this around. Yeah, yeah. That's something where... I think there's something to this where this can be a continually evolving series and we're just really scratching the surface of what I think is cool about this series. So I can't wait to see where this is going to go. And here here is my other question too. As far as we know, Harvey Dent's in charge. Right. We don't know that Two-Face has no role in this. Dude, true. Two-Face could be using the Harvey Dent voice. And it, you know, because the reason I say Harvey Dent's in charge is because um, the, the they always you know, they've always done with the dialogue for Harvey. They make it you know the, the yep. word balloons look not normal, you know. So they they tweak them around so it shows that it's Two Face's voice. So I'm assuming it's Harvey in charge. But again, Two Face is also an intelligent villain. You know, yeah, he's got the the coin issue, but Two Face himself is you know it does have Harvey's intellect. So. We very easily could be Two Face, you know, running the, being the puppet master, running the show behind the scenes. Or we don't know what's going on in Harvey's mind. We also Harvey don't know what's going on in between. Charge. We don't know what's going on between panels. Right. Exactly. I also love that there is this. We we then get another like Suicide uh, Squadish team that's being brought into. The, I mean, like a cliffhanger in this issue is. We've already got one side versus the other. You know, and then now we've got another Suicide Squad group that's been plopped into this whole scenario. It's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Which... And I think that actually is a, the Suicide Squad. I think they're because, they're, you know, they're they're calling in director. We're in a position in the facility. What? There's another team. What? Mm-mm. Dent. You know, yeah, I think that's Waller he's talking to. Oh, I agree. It's Waller. Oh, okay. Um, I, what I'm saying is, it's it's another Suicide Squad team. I mean, it's the right. members. The members are members that we haven't seen before as a group. It'll be interesting to see: are they being labeled as a Suicide Squad? Who's who's in charge? Or are they labeling this team something else? I think you're right. It's Suicide Squad. I'm not disputing that. Uh, we just haven't heard them labeled yet. And I agree. Waller sent them, whoever they are. So we're complete in complete agreement on that. Um, the thing is. In recent miniseries, the Suicide Squad team has had a different makeup than this group. So that doesn't mean that this isn't the Suicide Squad, though. Right. It's certainly an, interesting, an intriguing Suicide Squad team. 
Yeah, because we, we got KGBs there. And it's funny because I, I, I'll admit I did have to look up, make sure that was actually KGBs because I wasn't 100% certain. And I'm like, but it, I thought it wasn't. Okay, that is. Yeah. And then I'm looking at Grundy behind him where Solomon Grundy is awesome. The other three, I am not from, I, I don't know who, I know I've read the Zaz. one who looks. The one Zaz. What? The one with the scars. That's Zaz. That's Zaz. Okay. All righty. Is that Copperhead? Down below him. Yep. And who is the female with what looks to be fear toxin? Is that Lady Scarecrow? Or I'm trying to remember what her name was. Because it, this is a real cool looking team, you know, and it's it's not the the current Suicide Squad team, but again with Waller, she's going to pull people for different stuff. You know, she's got a mission that happens. What do I need? This is who I go with, and. Because it's funny, because at first, when I first saw this, I was thinking, okay, we got another zombie squad. We got Waller's zombie squad. Like, no, Waller doesn't have zombie squads. Waller's taking down this zombie facility, sending in a suicide squad to take down the zombie facility. So we got Task Force X versus Task Force Z, which versus this other zombie facility, whoever they are. So let's call them Y. So we got X, Y, and Z going on here. And I'm like, this is going to be a cool next issue. And again, next issue, beating a dead villain. Beating a beating a dead villain. Okay, how, how do you kill the dead? <laughs> so if, if it's who I think it is, I'm, I'm looking up right now, it was Madam Crow. Oh, okay. Um, she appeared in Detective Comics 943. In 2016, part of the Victim Syndicate, she was she was Scarecrow formerly. Oh, okay, cool. So uh, that was I know I'd seen her before. I was like trying to remember what was her what was her actual name though. It was her her real name is Abigail O'Shea, and we we read that. I mean that series was you know back a few years ago. I but, but she I thought she was going by um, the Scarecrow name at that time. It's been a while. But uh, I knew I'd seen her before. I love the look. Her look is like like suitably creepy, and she's got like yeah. kind of, it's kind of like got kind of a voodoo vibe to the whole thing that she's doing, which is nice. cool as well. But uh, it's a cool group of characters, and I'm, I'm anxious to see where this is. I don't know what if this is a Suicide Squad group or what the, their exact label is, but man, it was a cool cliffhanger to see a three front war- warfare going on. He is called Hawkman. His gauntlets possess awesome powers. How you doing, Sean and Jim? This is Rasu. Just want to talk to you guys about the state of DC Comics and the TV shows. What I've been hearing from fans out here is that DC has no direction as far as, far as they say none of the books matter. So what I think DC needs to do is have one book like the Justice League that shows everything that goes on inside the DC universe. Now, I don't feel this way, but I think the older fans want a book that feels connected to everything on the outside looking in of the DC universe. So one book should be able to tell you what's going on like the Justice League used to do in the past. Second state of DC universe, I think it's time for the Justice League to go global. Kind of like the Global Guardian, having a member from all continents on the planet that way you can have a rotating cast and you don't have to have the big seven in all the time. So like a Superman off in space where you can have Black Zam or some other big superpower heavyweight to take his place, you know, like with hip hop to a Wonder Woman and so on, a different type of Green Lantern. Let's move on to the state of DC's TV. If you're not watching The Peacemaker, you are crazy. This show is so entertaining. It's the number one streaming show right now. It's over everything, even the Disney stuff, because it's that good. Please go out and watch this TV show, along with Naomi. Great TV show, and they're different. The next state I want to talk about is, is podcast. Since you guys have turned me on to your great podcast, I said I want to turn some of the fans on to some great podcasts that I'm listening to. The first one up is Terry Justice about the 1940 vigilante carrier character. Terry Justice podcast. This guy actually does voices of different characters. It's like a TV show. So I would like somebody to check this out and, and listen to it. The next podcast I would like people to listen to is the History of Comic Books podcast. 
this guy will tell you things about how Wonder Woman was not the first superhero, how there were 47 ladies before her. A great show to watch on YouTube is a show called Fizz Pop. It will tell you where every superhero that we got today comes from. Like Batman came from a character called the Black Bat. And it's on YouTube and it's called Fizz Pop. Another great podcast to listen to is Earth 2 Podcast that tells everything about Earth 2 books in the DC Universe. And they're covering everything. The, the Fire and Fishwater Podcast Network has a show called Justice Society Podcast where they're going over every Earth 2 character in existence. Another great historical podcast is the classic Cavalcade, where he talks about old Kirby stuff, Grendel, all over the board. Great comic book podcast to listen to. If you're a fan of Marvel Cosmic, a great another podcast is Vandal Radio, but his main focus is on the Nova kids, who I love. If you are into giant monsters and kaiju and stuff like Ultraman, a great another podcast is Earth Destruction Directive, a great podcast to listen to. If you want a podcast about the creators that create the comic book, it's a comic book podcast called Creative Credit. He discusses all that. And as far as the new books people need to be picking up from Image, you need to be picking up a book called Ant. I only has two issues out. You probably can find it somewhere. And if you have the Marvel app, they have some new comic books out called Infinity Comic Books on Marvel. It's amazing. Different stuff. Like I say, they're eight pages long. Very fast. But it's it's a bunch of stuff to read, and they even got kids books where you got children. As far as solid uh, actual books to pick up, the new She Hulk book from Marvel is actually pretty good. Uh, so as a, it's a thing, and if, if people didn't pick up the Dark Hawk five issue miniseries, you missed out on a great book. I think people need to go back and pick that up and trade when it comes out. It's a great book. It's a new character. It's not the old Dark Hawk, but it's still good. You guys keep on raging. We're going to put out a good positive podcast, and I'll keep on listening. Here's one of the things that what his Peacemaker thing is uh, telling me is the fact that, yeah, there's some Internet crabbiness that goes on about DC properties, but here's the thing that I'm finding. So Peacemaker is the number one streaming show. Okay. That tells us something, right? (laughs) People are, are digging this show, and they're into it. So there's a difference between, I think, an internet crowd that's snarky and what the general public is actually embracing and and following. I'm glad to see that that show is doing really well because he mentioned uh, that it it is, you know, the most popular right now and was mentioning things like the Disney plus content, which I think is fantastic. I love that there's competitors out there because here's the thing. If we've got HBO max, we've got Paramount, we've got Disney plus producing this great geek culture, pop culture, Stuff and I'm talking about like there's there's some really great Star Trek stuff for example that's on Paramount Plus for example Netflix has you know things like The Witcher and stuff like that that are going on that are super cool we've got HBO Max doing stuff like you know Peacemaker and things like that that are coming out that are really sweet Disney Plus has its the Star Wars led and the Marvel stuff the more of this stuff that's coming out that's quality on different platforms it keeps pushing each platform to compete it's good for all of us so yeah. root. Here's the thing. Whether you're able to consume all of it or not is irrelevant. Invincible, for example. If you haven't watched Invincible, Invincible's amazing over at Amazon. And they've got um, you know just some great stuff going on over at Amazon as well. All of this stuff, it's a lot. And it's being able to digest all of it isn't necessarily possible for all of us. And I get it. I'm having trouble keeping up. What I've come to realize, though, is root for all of it. It should all do well. We want it all to be high quality. We want it all to be successful. We want it all to compete. We want to be able to have the discussion DC versus Marvel or, you know, whatever. Because of the fact that it's your quality universe versus our quality universe. That type of thing. So I root for it. I want it all to succeed because, and it is. It looks like right now we are getting to a quality level. I I go back to what I said earlier in the beginning of this episode. The film lineup that's coming out of DC, there's not a one of them that shouldn't do real well. You know, when you've got, you know, coming out of the starting, we've got the Batman kicking it off this year. Yep. Um, Catwoman Hunted, by the way, if you haven't watched it, I just watched that. That was a fun ride of the recently released animated series. No, animated movie, I should say, direct animation. That's a really good watch. 
we got the Flash coming up. We got Aquaman coming up. We got Black Adam coming up. I mean, what? I mean, that's a lineup and a half. And there's not a one of those that I'm not excited about. So as a DC fan right now, we got all that going on. On top of that, you got all this great content coming out from everybody else. It's a good, good time. And I love yes. that there, I love that there's too much to keep up with. It. I really, really do. And that it's all good. And it's my problem isn't one of, uh, I don't want to watch it because it's garbage. It's uh, I just don't have time to get to all of it. And that's okay. This is just a great time. And I love when he, his enthusiasm, when he was shouting out the TV shows and podcasts and, you know, that Infinite Comics he was talking about and uh, things like Darkhawk and having that having a, a, a reboot with a new character. It's that stuff's great, and I really am glad that our voicemail line is being used more and, and our, our Facebook group is being used more for things like that, shouting out um, things in and out of D.C. that you're intrigued by and interested in. Because uh, I, I think there's a great wealth of podcasts out there that are exploring all my, so many cool things and YouTube shows. He mentioned a, a great YouTube show out there as well. Um, please feel free to use our voicemail line for these purposes because uh, this is a cool time to be a fan. <laughs> Oh God, yeah, and I'll tell you, I'm I've finally been able to watch some of uh, Peacemaker. Thoughts? Oh God, I'm yeah. having fun with it, man. <laughs> I'm I'm absolutely 100% loving that show, you know. And again, it's it's weird because that um, that Black Label Peacemaker, you know, that persona, I absolutely love that. Yep. But the Peacemaker TV show is dramatically different than that. I equally love it. It's the same. It's, you know, the one is the comedic version of the other character. Sure. And I'll tell you, both of them are just absolutely outstanding. You know, and as you said, it was funny because when you're talking about how the strength that he, he, the peacemaker, you know, is, is a great character, but it, then you add to the strength of the supporting cast, how yeah. not all the cast have start having growth in it. You know, 100% goes along with it. And the stuff with Vigilante, completely agree with you. At first, I was like, I really don't like this. And then as it's gone on, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to really like this character, you know? Part of me does wish he wasn't so, you know, goofy. But I'm kind of, in this universe, he, he kind of works well. And I, I like the dynamic that this these two are bringing to the show. And again, it's... What episode? You know, what episode are you on? Um, episode three. Oh, keep strapping. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm on episode three, and I still I'm I'm loving the series, and I want more. And you know, so it's it's it, there's some really cool stuff going on, and I, it was funny because I'm sitting there, and you know, I find myself normally I fast forward through the intros. You got that option to skip intro. I'm yet to do it on this one because I just love that intro. And I'm sitting there, find myself dancing along with them, trying to get the moves. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I watched the intro too. I'm not dancing along with them, but I, oh, I You got to try. Give it a try, man. I, I, I no, 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 no. Here's what I want. I, I could care less about trying myself. I want a video of you trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't try the, I don't try that vigilante flip that he does. You know, I, I tried that once and I broke an end table, so I'm not going to do that one again. Yeah. But the other stuff, wait a minute, you, know, I'm doing you of all people down. should not be doing any flips. <laughs> <laughs> no flips allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not learned? <laughs> you know me well enough to know I would never try that. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> But I do wonder if that's the actor or a stunt. Dog. That is something I have. I've honestly wondered if that is the actual actor doing that flip. Oh, I think because it's got to be. I think it's got to be a stunt double. And, and the only reason why is that's not a negative on the actor at all. If there's any chance the actor could get hurt, I think they they tip. Well, I, you hear about actors doing all kinds of. Tom Cruise, yeah, you know, yeah does his yeah, yeah, they, yeah. a lot of his stunts. Jackie Chan, of course, famous yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so but I don't again, know. I don't know. Yeah, you because know, it's not like a. It's the way he does the flip. It's sure. You know, you know, if he's got some gymnastic type skills and whatnot, he probably could do the flip. But it, it is a it is a cool looking move. And again, this the I would love to see outtakes of filming of that because think. you know that took multiple takes and multiple rehearsals to do that uh, intro. Because if you if if you haven't seen the intro. I'll tell you, 
it, it's neat. It, it's a completely synchronized choreographed, you know, dance maneuvers, you know, and there's some like really subtle ones that I'm like, oh, I didn't even, like there's a scene when he draws his gun out, you know, and he did it so smoothly that it, it took me like, you know, a couple watches to actually physically see him pull it out of the holster. I'm like, that is cool. It's so funny that we're in an era where we're we're talking about this show and with its amazing cast and it's got a stellar cast. Yeah. On top of that, we've got Naomi running right now. We've got Star Girl. We've got Lois and Clark, or you know Superman and Lois. Um, sorry, <laughs> for as I have it, I love Lois and Clark. Superman and Lois is running right now, which has a ton of heart to it. Um, we've got the Flash. We've got Batwoman. I mean, what a lineup! I mean, that's a stellar lineup of shows that are are currently running and uh, it's in and on top of that you got peacemaker and and more stuff that's going to be coming from things like hbo max um because we're going to get part two of young justice the 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 second part of the seasons coming up um it's it's so which is um, by the way young justice anybody listening to this if you have not watched young justice I encourage you to start from the beginning. They also have on HBO Max, if you haven't watched it yet, Pennyworth is now on HBO Max. Season yes. one and two and season three is coming. So um, it's it's a good chance if you didn't get to watch it because Epics, I think, was the name of the platform that it was on before. And now you can – there's a companion comic book and you can now see Pennyworth season one and two on HBO Max, which is a terrific show. So, I mean, this is – wealth of DC content that's on there right now that's incredibly high quality is through the roof. I mean, it's really, really a great time to be a fan. Amen. Amen on that. Yeah, and again, Pennyworth is awesome. I absolutely love that one. Yeah, and a great writing and casting as well. Come on, Screel. Let's pay these plutonian beam makers a visit. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. That's always available in the show notes. RagingBullets at gmail.com is our email address. If you prefer to contact us that way. RagingBullets.com is our show website. That's where we always post our newest episodes as they're released and any information relevant to the show. That is always passed out to our Twitter and our Facebook fan page. We are proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community, and I can't encourage you enough to join it. Uh, people are always posting news articles and news updates and just relevant topics up there leading to some really cool discussion about those things as well. It's always a safe and a positive place to go. There's links to that group in the show notes as well, and uh, we really appreciate everyone who participates over there. The About Us section of the show website is where you're going to find details on how to connect with Jim and myself in social media and gaming platforms. We love to connect with all of you. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, can you tell us what's going on over at DCBService.com? We have Justice League uh, number 75, Death of the Justice League, 40% off, only four nineteen, and that also includes variant covers. We have Justice League hardcover, volume one, 50% off, twelve forty nine, and Justice League, the new 52, Omnibus, volume two, 50% off, only 75 Thank you, DCDS. Over at InStockTrades.com, we have Batman's Joker War Trade Paperback Volume 2. $16.99 regularly, 42% off, only $9.85. Batman Detective Comics Hardcover Volume 1 from 2021. This is $29.99 regularly, 40% off, only $17.39. If you miss any of these new releases, it's a great way to get them at the amazing deals that you get over at DCBService.com. And I want to thank both companies for continuing to support our show. Jim, before we close out the show, we're getting close to one of our show anniversaries. March 23rd is when the podcast originally kicked off, and we are slowly coming close there. And we like to do a special episode with that. So we're going to do a two-part episode taking a look at the classic series Camelot 3000, which Jim and I have not read. <laughs> um, so it's a big 12-part series. One of the reasons why we chose this is, first of all, it's from 1982. It's a classic series. It's Mike W. Barr and Brian Boland, and uh, certainly a classic series. I've heard about it a lot over the years and it's one of those that I've always wanted to read. 
and it's available on DC Infinite. So for anybody that's a subscriber to that, you can grab it. It's very easily accessible on all kinds of digital platforms. You can get collected editions of it. So this is something that's obtainable by everybody if they want to participate with us. And a lot of you already own it. So I think it's a great topic for us to talk on the show as an anniversary. And it's a big event that we haven't gotten to. I think as if we look at our podcast as a body of work, uh, we're trying to every so often grab some of the notable stories and this is something a little different than anything that we've covered before. So I'm excited for us to have a chance to talk about this one. Mr. Seglin, our next episode, we're going to be back and we're going to check in with the recent stories in Detective Comics. And we're going to get caught up on what's going on over in Action Comics. Some big events happening with both Batman and Superman. We will see you next week. Bye! All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim! Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't... I didn't need to buy that. 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 I didn't